Glenn is up first. So Glenn, come tell us a story, please. Yeah, hi. Hello. I, I, my name is Glenn, and the following are my credentials as judge of the icons of the 20th century. I grew up in the 70s. At 16, I made grill cook at Skelly Highway Chef Truck Stop off 1I80 in Omaha, which was really a crossroads of, of, of America. <clears throat> it was 24-7, 365 days a year. It had a jukebox full of rock and roll before it was ever called classic rock. The truck stop was really where I got my foundation and quite a few rites of passage, not all of them worthwhile. <laughs> it was the place where I watched truckers fight, swinging tire irons at each other in the parking lot and prostitutes circulating between the 18 wheelers advertising their trade. It was the place I rode my first motorcycle, inside the back storeroom of the kitchen, <laughs> where I learned how truckers stayed awake behind the wheel with something called trucker's aspirin, and how I found out I could work 16-hour shifts until 7 in the morning, drive to high school for the day, and then do the whole thing over again at three o'clock back at this truck stop. Yes, the highway chef was where I had one hand on a spatula and the other hand on the pulse of America. Now, sometimes I'll even come across people who think they know the music of their generation is most enduring and greatest. No. I just smile and provide the evidence. In 2011, I took a job as front office secretary at John H. Beveridge Middle School on 120th and Center. This is the very same middle school that I attended in the 70s. The front office secretary sees it all. All the drama, the scrapes, and all the tears. Literally the best job for tracking culture in America. And guess what I saw? The kids at Beverage in 2011 were wearing the t-shirts of the best rock and roll bands of the 1970s. The Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath, Aerosmith, and the Ramones. And these kids seem to have no clue that the Ramones were the favorite band of the bald secretary wearing business casual in the front office. Yet when I was in eighth grade, it was absolutely inconceivable that I might have an interest in my own parents' stodgy music and crooners like Tony Bennett or whoever they listened to. That was ancient history when I was in middle school. So, I've put a lot of thought into which individual rocker deserved the icon of the 20th century award. I thought hard about so many. Joey Ramone, Patti Smith, Angus Young, Bruce Springsteen, and others. But in the end, I take great pride to announce to you, drum roll, Lou Graham as the true greatest icon of the 20th century. Who's Lou Graham? <laughs> Lou is the powerful voice of the British American rock band called Foreigner. Lou has the charisma, the virility, creativity, and power that every teenage boy desires in that great myth of the American rock star. 
You'll remember some of the Foreigner's biggest hits, such as Jukebox Hero, Hot Blooded, Cold as Ice, and I Want to Know What Love Is. And in 1977, Foreigner came to Omaha to play the Civic Auditorium for their big Cold as Ice tour. When I heard about it, there was no question. Why not? I had money in my pocket, the keys to my mom's Chevy Bel Air, but who would go with me? I was 17. I was very awkward. I had never been out on a date before, never had a girlfriend, any dealings at all with the opposite sex. I was scared of girls. But after a year or so, time under my belt, my skills as a grill cook were getting pretty slick. And I was feeling pretty confident with my cook's apron tied tightly around my waist. And there was a new waitress on staff named Sherry. And I could talk to the waitresses through the serving window where I put up the orders. Sherry was 16, straight brown hair, dark brown eyes, and very pretty. So I called up her order, whatever her number was, and I just asked her, hey, Sherry, you want to go see a foreigner with me at the Civic Auditorium? She said yes. <laughs> it was as easy as that. I played it cool. I was elated. Kind of amazed, really, that a pretty girl would go out with me. I started putting her orders out with extra flourishes on the plate. <laughs> a few extra french fries. I was feeling so good, and we had Jukebox Hero on our jukebox in the restaurant. Whenever it played, I just started to bounce. I started feeling like maybe I was that Jukebox Hero. <laughs> well, I bought two tickets for the show at Homer's Records. Finally, that weekend rolled around for the big show. Sherry lived out here in Elkhorn. Well, I lived back in Omaha. Went back when there was a difference between the two cities. And I was driving out, when I was driving out to pick her up in Elkhorn, I had the radio on KOIL, the rock station, thinking it would be playing foreigner songs in promotion of the concert, but they didn't play any. And I came to the highway to turn off Dodge towards Sherry's house. My anticipation and excitement growing. When I see another vehicle coming toward me on the opposite side of the two-lane road. As we passed each other, I could see inside the other car, two people, two ladies and what looked like Sherry, riding in the front passenger seat, with possibly her mother driving in the opposite direction. It looked a lot like Sherry. Could that have been Sherry? Just when we had agreed, I would pick her up. Yeah, I think it was. But on the other hand, maybe it wasn't. I felt compelled to continue on to her house just to make sure. I knocked on the door with dread and trepidation, and her older brother came to the door and gave me a very dirty look. Is Sherry home? Nah, he shut the door. Fully humiliated, I got back in the car. On the road back, they finally played a foreigner song. The voice of Lou Graham. The lyrics go like this. You're as cold as ice. <laughs> You're willing to sacrifice our love. You're as cold as ice. You know that you are. Cold, cold, cold. As, as, as. Ice. As cold as ice, I know. I didn't go to the foreign show. 
and I've never seen Lou Gramm in person. After that time period, Borner continued making successful music through the 80s, and it came up with their biggest hit of all, a ballad titled, I wanna know what love is. I need you to show me. But before they released that album, they said there was a black man who heard it, and he said, wow, that song's got gospel overtones in it. In the end, they brought a large gospel choir into the recording studio to do the backup vocals. And that day in the studio, before the recording was made, the entire choir held hands and prayed together. And then they prayed the Lord's Prayer and dedicated the work to the Lord. And Lou Graham was in the control booth watching this. And when he saw it, Overwhelm, it overwhelmed him, and he began weeping. And they recorded the song. It became a huge international hit. But the gospel choir changed the nature of the song for Lou in a deep way. And sometime later, it began to work on him. And Lou, one day, joined some friends who had been going to church together in Rochester, New York. And Lou ended up giving his life to Jesus. And this changed him deeply. And if you ever hear him interviewed today, he's just the most humble and sincere guy who sings at church in Rochester, New York. Not as a star, but just a guy in the choir seeking to serve others and really learning what love is. So tonight on September 6th, 2024, I'm awarding this icon of the 20th century award to Lou Graham, not only due to his creativity, amazing talent, but for his act humbling himself, being open to change his entire worldview as a mature and successful adult. And from what looked like extraordinary outward success in life, he now acknowledges his failures for much of that life. Failure in his relationships, failures as a father, failure in meaning. And now changed and transformed as a more humble servant and disciple of Jesus Christ. He shows us no amount of worldly success or failures can ever lock us into unhealthy ways of living and that we're able to make significant changes in our lives no matter how old we are. So I'd uh, like to acknowledge and applaud a true icon of the 20th century. And also, Sherry, are you here tonight? No. Uh, if anybody knows her, I don't know if she's still here. Or not. No. Uh, congratulations, Lou Graham, and to Sherry. I'm sorry, Lou couldn't make it tonight. Pick it up. Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is Mary Jo because, you know, if you were married, named Mary in the 20th century, it was an icon. Everybody was named Mary, so we all had to have a middle name. So as I get older now, I find I have to go by my middle name again because I'm in the doctor's office, and they say, Mary, and three of us stand up because we're all getting older and going to doctors. In either the summer of 1985 or 1986, I just don't remember exactly what summer it was, I found I had the opportunity to meet one of the icons of the 20th century that I had really been admiring. I was working for Campfire Girls and Boys at the time. Anybody else? <laughs> This is the sign. Whoa, Hilo. Do we have any others? That was the welcome. Whoa, Hilo was the campfire word to say hello. It had three sides to the triangle. It stood for work, health, and love. And just like the Eagle Scouts, they had their own version called Horizon. 
you could earn your Horizon pin. Now, Campfire got in a lot of trouble, kind of like Boy Scouts did for appropriating Native American culture. But at that time, they still had this Horizon Conference for the high school students. And working in the office, I was one of the camp directors. I'm a genius at starting a campfire. Ask my husband. You often hear me saying, don't start, don't, don't touch my campfire. Don't put it out. So I knew all about camp, but then it came to me from the National Campfire Office in Kansas City that I had the opportunity to go be one of the resident assistants at the Horizon Conference in Fort Collins, Colorado. Now, mind you, I had never done anything like that before, been with a whole bunch of high school students at Horizon Conference. But I had the opportunity, and I really wanted to go because I found out that Sally Ride was going to be one of the speakers. Sally Ride? She had gone up in the Challenger twice, once in 1984, and I believe in once in 1983. She had run a robotic arm. She was an amazing, one of those people that as a woman, you'd never thought you'd see a woman astronaut. Do you know when that, when she got, she, when she spoke, somebody said, well, you know, what do you remember people asking you? The reporters asked her as she was being interviewed before she went on her first trip. Do you know what they asked her? What kind of makeup are you bringing with you? Are you worried about your ability to reproduce? Those were the questions. But I was going to get to meet her, and those are the things she talked about. And I'll tell you as we go along. So I went to the conference, and all these teenagers are coming in. They are all saying, well, hello to each other. We're excited. We get to go to the, stay on this college campus. We're in the dorms. I'm going to be in charge of 30 girls on my unit. There's lots of girls coming, and there's 100 boys and there are 700 girls at the conference because Campfire had become Campfire Girls and Boys. And as we crowded in to the cafeteria, the, the center, the student center, each one of us was given a name tag. Each of the girls was given a name tag to wear. Each of the boys, too. I don't want to forget the boys. And they gave us a schedule, and Sally Ride was going to be one of the first people to speak. And also, Dr. Wayne Dwyer, Pulling Our Own Strings, was the book he was promoting at that time. I'd never really heard of him, but I thought that sounded good. But Sally Ride was going to be there. She was born two years before me, 1951. But she already had four college degrees. She was amazing. And she was speaking the next day. And we got into the dorms. We all checked in. All the girls introduced themselves. And then I got called to a meeting. Now, mind you, I had had to fly to get to Colorado, and I was scared of flying. So I was wide awake on that entire flight, kind of shaking in my boots. I'd only been on a previous flight once, I think. And then we were all called to a meeting about what we needed to do, I thought. But then they said, we want you to know you're going to hear it from the girls. One of our attendees was an attempted assault. It's like, what? They had given those girls those name tags, had their first name and their last name and the state they were from on it. And somebody had approached the, the girls and said, hi, Amy. Your leader told me that you would help me carry these boxes in another room. Oh, you're from Colorado, so I know. And so Amy had gone with them into the other room. And she, this man told her to unbutton her blouse and wield a knife on her. But Amy was a campfire girl, and she kicked him, and she kicked that knife out of her room. 
and she ran to the other room. But we were instructed, you need to have the girls all take their name tags off. And they should only have their first name and please give them a lecture about not knowing a room with somebody. Well, I thought that'll be okay. We're still good to meet Sally Ride the next day and she's gonna talk. But if you've ever been with a group of high school students, does anybody work with high school students? Raise your hand if you do. You know the rumors go what? Fast as lightning, the rumors started going around the room about this assault and that she had been cut and all this stuff. And the girls were crying. I don't know where the boys were, so I can't tell you what was happening with them. They were in a different building. And all night, that night, before I got to meet Sally Ride, I was up all night trying to calm kids down, bring peace to the situation. But the next morning, we got up and we got to go give Sally Ride talk. She talked about shooting for the stars and grabbing what you want. Did you know, and this sticks with me to this day, did you know that she saw the advertisement in a newspaper that they were looking for members of the crew at NASA? It's kind of like Space Cadet movie. Have you seen that movie? But Sally Ride had four degrees. She wasn't a bartender, if you've seen the movie. So Sally Ride, her application when she was set it in, she was accepted. She was one of 8,079 applicants. And she made it, she said, because she was shooting for the stars. She was a tennis athlete. She had won all kinds of things. And her athletic ability, including to her degrees, made her get into group eight. Now, if you saw Space Cadet, you know that they had to do all kinds of tests. And they named their group. They named their group TFNG. Now, I didn't know until just recently what that stood for as lingo in the group. It stands for the fucking new guy. <laughs> but there she was. I have to look at my notes. And pretty soon we had another meeting right after that before Wayne Dwyer. I got to meet her hand to hand, hug to hug. She's the same height as me, two years younger. I thought, oh my gosh, this is what we want our kids to know. This is what I want them to walk away from this conference with. And then, and then we got another meeting. Everybody come to the meeting. Of course, there's no cell phones, right? So this was like passed around. <sighs> At that meeting, we just heard this amazing talk. One of the girls had somebody expose themselves to her. And somebody else reported that somebody was crawling in through a window in one of the girls' rooms. They had the police officer come talk to us. He said, well, I want to tell you this. Every time I've ever worked with young people who someone, they have exposed themselves, a man has exposed himself to them. I'm gonna tell you what they don't remember, but this girl gave a very, very clear description. She told us the brand and color of the shoes he was wearing. And the officer said, nobody tells us that. We don't believe this really happened. There were people, there were men washing the windows. We don't know what happened, but if you worked with high school students, you know rumors. They fly and they get bigger. And all I could think of was Sally Ride's message has been lost in a way at this conference. In the end, again, another sleepless night. Everybody worried, concerned, the whole place getting locked down the best it could at that time. I listened to Wayne Dwyer, encouraged the kids with the messages. 
She spent 343 hours in space. She was also our first gay astronaut. And so many things. And I talked about pulling your own strings. And I think now, what a great message from her. But then when I th was thinking about this story, I wanted to say, how do we look on that? And how do those young women that were at those conferences, how do they tell their story? What story are they telling? Can you really have this happen to you and notice the color and make of their shoes? What really happened? Thank you. The game of baseball is timeless and marked with nostalgia. More so than any other sport, tales of the greats are passed down from generation to generation. The modern inheritance is tops cards of noteworthy sluggers, and kids learn to play catch in their backyards with their dads, all along imagine they'll be the next legend. My family didn't give a shit about any of that. <laughs> we didn't care about any sport other than Husker football. My parents only absorbed that fandom through osmosis. They moved to Nebraska in 1980, and had absolutely nothing else to get excited about when they made the decision to settle in the least interesting town in a flyover state. <laughs> My folks are from South Dakota, they're right here. <laughs> and they didn't have any allegiance to any professional sports team that I can think of. My dad grew up storing a shotgun in his locker and going hunting before and after school. And my mom was raised in a strict Catholic home where fun was illegal. So, <laughs> since bringing a loaded firearm to public school was generally frowned upon in the years that I came of age, my dad didn't influence my sports interests much. Cracker Jacks are gross, and I have a hard time naming more than a few active players, but there was one story of America's pastime that my father entrusted me with. The fact that we cared so little about baseball makes it more, more, all the more cherished to me. Growing up, I annually heard some vi version of the following story. When my dad graduated high school, he joined the Army and was almost immediately stationed in Germany. His first job in Germany was driving staff cars. He was the chauffeur for a handful of visiting dignitaries and important generals, but the real thrill was driving around a baseball player whose name I could never remember. He was only known to me as that baseball player my dad grew, drove around for a week in Germany. I always assumed he was some minor leaguer or team mascot. A serious celebrity wouldn't spend a week in the back roads of Europe without a publicist and a documentary crew in tow. Likely it was kind of the person that wanted a free vacation or an easy way to make himself feel more famous. Cool story, Dad. I eventually remember the name, player's name long enough to Google it, and it turns out I was wrong. It was 1983 Baseball Hall of Famer Brooks Robinson. 18-time All-Star, two-time World Series champ, 16-time Golden Glove winner, American League MVP, World Series MVP, his number five retired by the Baltimore Orioles, the greatest third baseman of all time, the human vacuum cleaner. This guy was a big deal. I had no idea. I suspect, based on the way my dad told the story, he didn't really either, but for a week, they were road trip buddies. They had an aggressive schedule, and they covered as much of Germany as the Amer United States military had. They hung out with American troops, always with boxes and boxes of baseballs in the back of the truck. I'm imagining my dad on a regular drive. It couldn't have been that much different from our family road trips. Telling stories, getting annoyed in traffic, pulling over to go to the bathroom because my dad's, quote, teeth are floating. <laughs> but this time, Brooks is chilling in the front seat, but my dad probably let him play with the radio. By the end of their time together, my dad, a man who doesn't get starstruck, was, dare I say, Brooks' friend. I mean, how could you not have been? This, isn't unsubstan this is unsubstantiated, but I mean, after seven days in a car, you tell me you don't know somebody like their family. My dad never requested one of those baseballs, but as their time together neared its end, Brooks tossed him one. It read, to Randy, best of luck, Brooks Robinson. Over the years, that baseball was lost. The tale always ended with my dad slightly shaking his head. I wish I knew where that ball ended up. One day, he found it. My dad was going through a bunch of old boxes, and there it was. The ball. At least, I mean, it had to be the ball. I didn't, like, DNA test it or anything, but there wasn't any other baseballs floating around that I could think of that were signed 50-odd years ago, tossed to my dad, who subsequently tossed it into a random box. But time, time had led to patinaed calfskin and faded ballpoint ink, but if you held the ball just right, kind of squinted a bit, and used your imagination to fill in the blanks, there it was. To Randy, best of luck.
Brooks Robinson. I had an idea. My boss is the kind of man I cannot relate to. He's a baseball fan. For my idea, though, we needed to find some common ground. I told him about the ball, and he woefully mourned its state, though he said that kind of thing tends to happen. Hardcore baseball guys don't collect baseballs. If they do, they live locked away in the darkness with hopes of preserving them from the horrors of UV rays and oxidation. And even then, time can be a real bastard to an autographed baseball. Months later, on a random day, at a random time, this overly zealous, baseball fanatical, mild-mannered regional manager handed me a Ziploc bag with a baseball, in, with a baseball inside. It read, to Randy, best of luck, Brooks, Reb Brooks Robinson. Close enough, my dad had a new ball. I ordered a top-of-the-line UV-protected glass case that would display two baseballs with an engraved plaque that said Brooks Robinson. They forgot the plaque, but in went the old ball and the new ball, side by side, wrapped and placed under the tree until my dad opened it on our living room on Christmas Day. When he opened it, he goes, ooh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> to translate, my dad was pretty fucking stoked. He so soaked it in for a moment and then said, oh, I wonder if he still remembers me. I mean, we spent a week together driving all over Germany. I had another idea. Sportscollectors.net is the internet database where creeps and fanboys track down celebrity addresses and crowdsource them in order to get them, send them mail and try to get autographs. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> Even if you're not a creep or a fanboy, I am, but if you're not, it's an okay place for you too. Brooks's reputation among sportscollectors.net's creep fanboys and totally normal dudes was sterling. In autograph lingo, he got tons of traffic but always returned. If you're a normal person, that means a lot of people send him mail requesting a signature and he would send those items back. After all, old people like Brooks love old things like the United States Postal Service. I wrote Brooks a letter and concluded with a question. Do you remember my dad? Nine days later, a package came back with a note inside. Chris, I certainly remember being in Germany and riding in a Jeep and signing a lot of balls. I'm sorry, I don't remember your dad. Please tell him when we meet again, I won't forget it. As an aside, what a great fucking line. My best, Brooks Robinson. I framed the letter and presented it on Father's Day. I'm sure it was a bit of a bummer, but you couldn't deny how great of a guy Brooks was. Even after admitting to someone they didn't leave much of an impression, he still found a way to make a new connection. A promise that I truly believe he intends to make good on. There's something unnatural about celebrity. I don't believe human beings are meant to be famous. Parents advise against idolizing public figures since much of their fame is built, fame is built on frivolity, narcissism, self-absorption, and dumb luck. But like anything, there are ways to use fame for good. I don't know what Brooks's core beliefs were, but I know for sure he cared about people. The kind of man that would spend a week with no press, driving around Germany handing out baseballs. The kind of man that recognized that his driver probably wouldn't mind one of those baseballs, but he was not gonna ask for it because it was on the clock. The kind of man that treated that driver with such care and such respect that that driver would wonder decades later if he made the same impression on him that Brooks did on the driver. The kind of man that would make a new connection even when that answer was no. I don't know what Kanye West or Deion Sanders are like in person, but I have a pretty good guess. The world needs more Brooks Robinsons. On September 26, 2023, at the age of 85, Brooks Robinson passed away. Celebrity deaths don't really bother me. When you enter the realm of fame, you trade aspects of your humanity in exchange for a larger platform. I'm not supposed to relate to you as a person, but as a symbol of something you represent. This can be a good way of making money, but it's not a particularly good way of making people care about you. But that night in my basement, I had a personal moment of silence for Brooks. Even after his death, it seems I'm still just learning who Brooks was, and I still haven't watched a single highlight. I opened up my browser and typed in www.sportscollectors.net to look up his address one last time. Brooks died on September 26th, 2023. The last person that successfully received an autographed mail from Brooks mailed an item to him on September 18th, eight days before his death. Six people received their item back from Brooks after he had already passed away. I bet Brooks enjoyed watching each one being open. I bet to each person opening the mail, the item was more than just an autograph. I bet it felt more like getting a letter from an old friend. Um, so when I was in high school, I, um, was in love with art and everything art. So this is kind of an art story. Um, can everyone hear me? I don't know. Okay. 
melting, oozing metal slides down the frame. My eyes trace the undulating lines that make up the scene. I hold my breath as I stand still, admiring such a masterpiece. Salvador Dali, an unconventional artist, was a master of his craft. His hands able to capture a realistic composition, but his imagination gave way to a new and unique vision. If you don't know who Salvador Dali is, you might be living under a rock. <laughs> if you've never seen his work, I suggest a quick Google search. He's, uh, his artwork is a little bit out of the ordinary. The first time I saw one of his paintings in a book, I was both confused, or I was both amazed and bewildered. The depth, the richness, the contrast made the image come to life. The deconstruction, the illusions, and the form pulled me into a strange new world. Looking at a dolly, one can't help but have a reaction. What is that? Gross. Whoa. I heard it all from the American tourists that filled the, lar that filled the vast open space. The Dolly Museum in the beautiful Spanish countryside was an anomaly in itself. The spring of 1994, I went to Spain on a class trip and we got to go to the Dolly Museum and um, it was one of the best moments of my life. The cold, steely architecture and the monument to this icon's legacy were visible from almost a mile away. And much like his work, the museum didn't seem to belong among the more natural beings that surrounded him. Walking through the museum, I know I had an intimate look into the mind of a creative genius. With each step, I felt myself getting further and further away from reality. The liquefied clocks, the deformed bodies, twisting and turning in every way, the disturbing faces looking deep into your soul. I felt like Alice in Wonderland. All I needed was my white rabbit and Cheshire cat. It was as if I entered one of my all too familiar dreams. As an amateur artist and writer, I think my mind wanders into unknown territory as well. As a child, I suffered from extreme night terrors, giant red lobsters with claws snapping close enough that I could feel the wind against my skin, muddy dark lakes teeming with long hissing snakes. I felt connected to this iconic man I had never met. As I followed my class back to the huge white tour bus, I knew that I had to follow my passion. I knew that I had to be true to my colorful heart. I had always wanted to be an artist, but as I stopped to sneak one final glance at the shiny silver egg atop the 15 foot pedestal, which is this monument outside of the museum that you can see from the road. It's kind of cool because it's just balancing there. Um, as I snuck a final glance, I made a silent promise to both myself and Dolly. There was no longer any doubt in my mind. I would absolutely be majoring in art and design. So I'm just kind of winging this because I just decided to do this today um, and I thought for about I don't know 15 minutes of my day like 20th century icon like who do I dig um, the first one that came to my mind was Lily Tomlin because I am very much in love with her yeah. deeply um, so I did a little research stuff I most I already knew um, I actually named my dog after her character from Grace and Frankie um, after we almost named the dog Lillian from another character that I loved from a different show because I watch a lot of fucking TV. <laughs> but so Lily Tomlin is amazing. If 
anybody knows who that is, I'm sure some of you do. Um, what really got me into her was her comedy back in the day. She actually started comedy in Detroit. I learned that today. That's where she grew up. Um, and she has so many different characters, and she's like a total weirdo and awesome and hilarious. Uh, and she just does so much awesome shit. Like, all, all of these different, like, animal welfare, civil rights, health care. She stands up for everybody. She's amazing. Um, so, sorry, killing this, I know. Um, what really, like, got me into her, besides Grace and Frankie, was I watched her when I was a kid, 9 to 5, of course, because that movie's amazing. Um, but when I was younger, I bought a record, vinyl, and it was her stand-up um, with Edith Ann on the cover with the big chair, and, um, and it has her signature on it, and it was you know, a printed signature, Years, years later, I went to um, Half Price Books, and I found that same record. I'm like, I think I have this, but there was two signatures on it. And I was like, holy shit, this is her real signature on this. And I freaked out, but there was no price. And I'm like, what are they, just like giving this away? Like, what's happening? So I went up to the dude, and I'm like, so how much do you want for this? Like, and I was trying, I'm not cool at all. I say <laughs> dumb shit, and I'm like, oh, it's signed, holy shit. And he's like, how much you want to pay for it? I'm like, I don't, a million dollars shit? I don't know what. So I ended up saying 10. And he went, okay. And I'm like, fuck yes. So now I have two copies, but one is actually signed. And I only cried like a little bit after I got it because I was so excited. And it was 10 bucks, like totally worth it. Um, I just, I, she's the first person that came to my mind because she's wonderful. And Frankie from the show Grace and Frankie, she is just like, an artist, and she's hilarious. Every like, she is what I want to be when I'm 85. <laughs> That's how old she is now, and she's just my hero. Um, I had more notes, but this is probably short, so that's it. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
scientific community, and I think he is an amazing person. Unfortunately, he has passed, so I'm unable to meet him unless I see him in the afterlife. I hope I do. Thanks for listening.